Now that we've seen how the graphical method works in terms of seeing differences, let's take a look at the statistical method. This is called ANOVA, which stands for Analysis of Variance. Now in the ANOVA, very similar to the multivariate, what we're going to see is a Y factor, which is going to be related to the measures, and now we're going to see distinct rational subgroups. And so what we're going to be able to do is see how much variation is within a subgroup, and then track the variation between the averages of each of the subgroups, which will show us variation between the subgroups. So when we look at this, the mathematics that's going on in the background is about the sum of squares. Now remember, back many videos ago, we had talked about statistical thinking, and we talked about how to calculate the sum of squares. And so here, what you can start understanding is that when we take a look at this, we will calculate the sum of squares total for all of the different rational subgroups we see. So that's for all of the data. And then we'll take a look at it one factor at a time. And then finally, there's an error term. So we look at the overall performance. That's looking at the capability of the process. When we're looking at each of the factors at a time, we're looking at the accuracy. Where is it actually in the location scale? And we'll take a look at the, the within factor. That's about the precision or the amount of error that's happening within the treatments. Now, when we look at this, we see a graphic here. And here we see there's five different subgroups that we can see. So there's one sample, one factor. So there's one Y we measure. That's what a one-way one ANOVA means. It's one Y factor. And here we have five independent samples. And each of those samples has an average. And then we can calculate the overall average, called the grand mean, for all of those. And so the implicit hypothesis test is that the null hypothesis is there's no difference between mu1, mu2, mu3, mu4, or mu5. And then the alternative is at least one of those subgroups is statistically different than the others. Now, the mathematical hypothesis doesn't tell us which one. However, looking at the practical performance measure, we can tell. What do we need to know about that performance measure? Is bigger better, smaller better, or do we need it to be consistent? So, the ANOVA analysis of variance is telling us at least one of those means is different. And when we look at the magnitude of those and interpret what we know about the process, we can usually find out which one is Bob, best of the best, and which one is Wow, worst of the worst. So the one that has the magnitude of performance in the desired direction with the least variance is typically the best of the best. The one with the magnitude in the wrong direction and the most variance is usually what we would call the worst of the worst. So this type of chart is comparing between sample factor and within sample, which is the error in the formula. Okay, And what we're seeing is, is there some information we see about differences among all the sample means that we've observed? Now, what we see is that this one-way analysis of variance is actually related to what's called an ANOVA table. And in the ANOVA table, there's a several different versions of this, which will run across in different tools, as we see, because this table is also used for regression, and it's also used in designed experiments. What we see is that the table itself has a, a several different rows in it. So the first is talking about the type of statistics that we have, and it identifies the source. Where is the data coming from? So first we see between, and then we see within, and then we see total. The second column is the sum of squares, and this is the calculated sum of squares that comes out of our formula. So first we have the sum of squares for the main factors, and then the sum of squares for the error, or this within, and then the total sum of squares, which is the sum of the two. When we come to the column degrees of freedom, we see that the between sample is going to be 5 minus 1, or 4. If we take a look at the next one, we'll see it's g times 9, 10 minus 1, because each of the subgroups is 10, so it's 10 minus 1, so that would be 45. And the total sum of squares then would be equal to 49. Now remember, when we talked about sum of squares much earlier in the earlier graphic, we said we're losing minus 1 degree of freedom because we're calculating everything relative to the mean. Now, the next column is mean squared error or variance. So this is the variance that's coming out. So it's the sum of squares for the factor, divided by the degrees of freedom. So sum of squares divided by g minus 1. Within is going to be the sum of squares for the error of the total, divided by g times n minus 1, or 45. 
Now, we're going to calculate a statistic. The statistic is called the F statistic, after Sir Ronald Almer Fisher, who created this methodology. And what it is, it's the ratio of the mean squared error for the factor divided by the mean squared error for the, the noise, or the within variation, this error term. And so that's just a straight ratio. That is then going to be compared on a lookup table in terms of the degrees of freedom for the between and within versus this factor that's been calculated, and that will then give us a probability. Now what we see is that probability can be compared to 0 0.05, our decision. So if this is less than 0 0.05, we would say that component of variation is statistically significant. If it's greater than 0 0.05, the conclusion would be that's not a significant factor. Okay. Now we can interpret this data in a number of different ways graphically. So in this next PowerPoint slide, what we see is I have two factors, A and B, and they're at two different levels. Okay, so I, I'm just calling them arbitrarily 1 and 2 for factor A and 1 and 2 for factor B. And what we see is as factor 1 increases from 1 to 2, and factor B goes from uh, on, across those levels, we see that it's, it's increasing on the same slope of the line. When factor B equals 2, we see that there is a higher level of performance, but it's actually following the same slope of line. And this is what we call a main effects plot. It's talking about what is the relationship in terms of the y variable to a and b as the two change together. Now, if we look at the next plot, we see something totally different. Here we see an interaction effect. In other words, here as we change uh, a from lo low to high, factor b inverses its relationship. And this inverted relationship we call an interaction effect. In other words, as one is going high, the other is going in the opposite direction. So interaction effects can be rather interesting, and we'll talk about these some more when we talk about designed experiments. Okay. Now, we also get some information out of this ANOVA table. And so here I have a more complex ANOVA, and I have five different X's. And I see I have here the coefficient, which is the coefficient from the formula. I also have the standard deviation for each of the terms. And then I have the, uh, the, the values here, and finally the p-value at the end. And what we see here is that x5, the p-value is 0.628. All the others are under 0.05. And what this says is we have now one factor out of these five where the, the factor is actually not significant. Since each of these is an independent variable, what I can do is I can what's called reduce the model. Reducing the model means I'm going to just eliminate factor x5 from the analysis. When we talk about Minitab and we see the example, we see when we do eliminate that factor from the model, what's happened is we're taking it away and therefore we're putting its contribution to the variation someplace else. Where? Well, let's see. If we take a look at the effect, here is the ANOVA table where we have the main effects and the interaction all in this between term. Within is noise and missing terms. So when we reduce the model, what we're doing is we're taking the effect of x5 from a main effect and putting it into the noise. So we would see the sum of squares for the noise component increasing slightly, perhaps, whereas the sum of squares for between will also change. And so this is how we deal with this effect in terms of reducing the, the model. Now this is a very exceptionally good tool for us because as we reduce the model we're basically saying x5 is not a significant factor in terms of causality. So we only do this when we have a very big difference in terms of the p-value. Like this was 0.6 instead of 0.05. So clearly mathematically we're not even close to being saying that that is a statistical component. Now we also see that there can be some other problems with ANOVA that have to be evaluated. There can be, of course, errors in the measurement system. Maybe we don't have a lack of fit in this model, or it's not a, a linear model, it's got some curvature to it. Uh, in other words, it's quadratic or cubic. Maybe some of the main effects could be eliminated, like we did with that X5. Or maybe there are some factors that are not actually included in this analysis because we haven't thought about them. So maybe there's a factor D or F, and those are actually significant factors. So those are unknown effects, and we call those red X's. 
Those are things that are coherent signals that may be in the noise, but we haven't seen them yet. In addition, the ANOVA model itself is expecting to see normality, independence in data, and also homogeneity of variance. That means variation within each of the subgroups should be more or less pretty much equal. Now, the problem with ANOVA is we can check those terms. So here we see we get an ANOVA output, and it's going to tell us about residuals. And we're going to talk about residuals particularly as a, as a subject right after we talk about regression analysis. And so I'm going to postpone that discussion till later. However, we see on the right-hand plot, so the left-hand plot is the residuals analysis. On the right-hand plot, we get the output of data. And here, this is performance of individual people. It's productivity. So the data level here is productivity. And we can clearly see there's a very big difference between somebody who is scoring over 500 in all of their data and somebody who's down at 100. So I clearly see Bob and Wow. So what do I do? I have to go to those rational subgroups and find out what physically is happening in this fourth subgroup compared to the fifth subgroup. Why is there such a difference? Are they doing the same job? Are they doing them in the same way? Are they using the same equipment? Do they have the same training? What actually could cause that discussion? So I'm on now the search for causes. And so we're going to try to understand causality and then how we actually can then make a judgment for did that particular cause create the problem. So right now we're just building now a formal set of hypotheses to go check and to evaluate in an experimental condition or in some sort of demonstration test. We can also see that this ANOVA gives us a tabular output in Minitab. And here we see the ANOVA table and it says, here I have factors. So there are seven factors because there were eight people we saw. The p-value is zero. So there's something statistically significant. And we saw the difference between four and five. We see the r squared adjusted is 88%. Now we'll come back and talk about what r squared is when we talk about regression analysis. But that's 88% out of 100. And what that means is there's only 11% of the variation we observe in that data set that is not explained by this mathematical relationship. And we can then see graphically the same thing we saw in the box plot. So as we're looking at that, we have a pretty good idea about what's going on, both from the graphical perspective and from the ANOVA viewpoint. Now, ANOVA is a very robust test. Even if the data isn't quite normal, even if the variances aren't quite equal in the subgroups, we can still use ANOVA to tell each rational subgroup do they have a difference in terms of the same mean? We can also obtain slightly good results if the data is slightly correlated. In other words, it's, it's not really independent data. So if you're in doubt, contact your local black belt, master black belt, or statistician, and you can get some better feedback in terms of should you be using this data analysis. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at an example of this in Minitab. So you have a chance to get your hands a little dirty on the data and see how do I actually make this work.